Hej alla ni som följer oss live och välkomna till dagens pressträff. På pressträffen medverkar finansminister Magdalena Andersson och IMFs verkställande direktör Kristalina Georgieva. Pressträffen kommer att hållas på engelska. Efter pressträffen kommer sändningen att finnas tillgänglig på regeringens webbplats regeringen.se. Welcome everyone to this press briefing as I begin my tenure as chair of the International Monetary and Financial Committee, the IMFC. And I am succeeding uh, Lesetja Kanyago, who is uh, governor of the South African Reserve Bank. And he has successfully chaired uh, the committee for the last three years. And I want to start by thanking him for his excellent work, not the least his efforts during the current crisis. The IMF is and should be the hub of global economic cooperation. And the IMFC provi provides advice to the fund and its 190 member countries on issues of strategic importance. And I'm honored to contribute to this important multilateral cooperation and for the confidence the IMF member countries have shown in me. I'm taking on this role during challenging times, and I am aware of the responsibility that it entails. Because this pandemic is a historic challenge, first and foremost to public health, but also for the global economy. And the IMF responded quickly with much needed crisis support to member countries through 2020, and I know that the IMF will continue to support its members in the year ahead, and I look forward to contributing to that work. With me today is Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the IMF. It's a privilege to have you here. Thank you very much for joining, and I very much look forward to working with you in the coming years. And I think it's important to state that the quick response from the fund during your leadership has been very important for many countries during this crisis. Uh, I will start by making a few remarks on the state of the global economy, the need for relevant fiscal policy and the important role of IMF in the years to come. And I will then hand over to Kristalina who will provide her reflections and remarks. But starting with the global economy, about a year ago, the IMF forecasts indicated that the world economy would grow by more than 3% in 2020. And then the pandemic hit. And in its latest forecast, the IMF adjusted the expected global growth for 2020 to minus 4.4%. This is a much sharper contraction than during the 2008 global financial crisis. And the pandemic has placed enormous pressure on our societies and the recovery is likely to be both gradual and uneven. And undoubtedly, the scars will last for years to come. And at the current juncture, the social and economic situation is especially grave in the poorest countries. Because for almost 25 years, we've had a fantastic development. Extreme poverty has declined steadily. But the pandemic has meant that we see a very worrying setback. In 2020, the number of people living in extreme poverty is estimated to have increased from 27 to 150 million, 15 million people. So this crisis is taking a massive toll on the poor and vulnerable with high human and economic costs. And global action is urgent and needed and support from the IMF and other multilateral institutions will be very important. So the global economy is in a truly difficult situation. And naturally, the recovery depends on the spread of the virus and, crucially, on the rollout of vaccines. And in that race, the unprecedented speed of vaccine development provides hope. And now, we need a just as unprecedented speed of vaccination. The number one argument being health, of course, but the economic effects of a speed of vaccination are enormous. 
Now let me continue with uh, fiscal policy. During this crisis, countries have responded with extraordinary fiscal support. And taking firm action was the right thing to do in order not to compromise with health of our population or to protect people's livelihoods. And without this response, more people would have been unemployed, more firms would have gone bankrupt. The global economy would have been in an even worse situation. An important lesson from the global financial crisis was that support should not be withdrawn too early. So right now, we should continue our crisis support. But once circumstances allow, we should, however, restore public finances to ensure preparedness for the next crisis. Because previous economic crises have also taught us that as well as being timely, fiscal support must be temporary. And when the time comes to support our economies to recover from this crisis, we should act smart and effective. Because we have a remarkable opportunity to rebuild our economies and equip them for the future. Through sustainable investments, we can create jobs and at the same time push our economies into a more green, more inclusive and more digital future. So reforms during the recovery phase should be designed both to restart the economy and to address long-term challenges such as the climate crisis and the growing inequalities. Because we can and we must emerge stronger from this crisis. So just let me say a few words on the important work of IMF in this situation. The IMF's core mandate is to be the global firefighter in times of economic distress. And with its broad membership, its global approach and position at the center of the global financial safety net, it is uniquely placed to promote financial stability. And the IMF will be a key player if we are to build a world that is fairer, more robust and more sustainable before, than before the pandemic. And to do so, the, bun, the fund must be accurate, agile and all-inclusive. On accuracy, I think the fund should uphold this accurate and high-quality work on forecasts, analysis and advice. So the IMF provides crucial guidance for policymakers across, across the globe. And the importance of this work has been emphasized during these uncertain times. But the fund must also be accurate in its financing activities, calibrating them to achieve the highest possible impact. The IMF is and should also be an agile institution. Its lending and analytical tools should be adapted when needed to always stay relevant and attuned to developments in the global economy. Being agile also means adapting to meet new challenges. And IMF and the managing director have shown great commitment in making sure that the fund will be part of a global response against climate change. I fully support that, that and I look forward to, on, to discussion on how this work can, con, can be further developed. The fund must also be all-inclusive, both in terms of promoting inclusive economic growth in its member countries and when it comes to the governance of the fund itself. Evidence from the IMF supports that the pandemic is likely to increase inequality within and between countries. Through the disproportionate impact of containment measures on low-skilled workers, the young and on women, COVID-19 risks amplifying long-standing inequities in our societies. And the IMF shows that workers most at risk of reductions in income or permanently losing their jobs not surprisingly are those that are least able to bear them, the poor and the young in the lowest paid jobs. Vulnerable groups must therefore be protected and as economies start to recover, tackling inequalities will be of essence. Income equality and gender equality are important objectives as such, but it is also smart economics. Because inclusive growth ensures that everyone can participate in and contribute to the development of the economy. And we need all the human capital we have to restart the global economy. These issues are on the IMF agenda and I look forward to taking them further as chair of the IMFC. To conclude, 
The world and the IMF's 190 member countries face a historic challenge. The IMF will continue to support its members' effort to build a world that is more prosperous, more robust, and more sustainable than before the pandemic. To do so, the IMF must be accurate, agile, and all-inclusive. And as the platform for global multilateral economic discussions and cooperation, the IMFC is uniquely placed to give advice towards this end. I also want to thank the fund and its, member, and its members for the warm welcome as the chair of the IMFC I've received. And I'm confident that together we can build an even stronger IMF and a strong, stronger multilateral cooperation. With these words, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to the IMF Managing Director. Kristalina, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Anderson. I cannot stress enough how delighted I am uh, that the membership of the IMF has selected you to head the IMFC of years. I have had a chance to work together in the past. Uh, I also have seen you in action in this crisis and your deep experience, as well as your strong commitment to multilateralism are exactly what the IMF needs today. Uh, you are also making history as the first woman to lead the IMFC in its 76 uh, years of history of the IMF. Uh, it's so fitting that you are the one that takes uh, the uh, first shot at the IMFC chair uh, as, as a woman coming from uh, a country with very strong traditions in pursuing gender equality. One is seven women have exactly the same legal rights as. Uh, like I want to uh, pay tribute to the outgoing uh, chair, uh, Governor Secha Kianyango of South Africa. He has steered the IMF ship in the choppy uh, COVID waters so extremely well. I recall uh, how we swiftly called two virtual meetings of the IMFC in the uh, early weeks of the pandemic. And this is what allowed us to swiftly our action as a first responder at the time of crisis. I uh, think in three countries benefiting from IMF uh, over the last uh, nine months and $3 billion being provided uh, very important to recognize that 49 of these countries are low-income countries, and for this country, MF was and continues to be the only sizable source of financing uh, at the time of crisis. I am uh, very, very grateful to Nasetia for what he has done, and now Stepping into your three year, uh, Magdalena, uh, unquestionably a challenging time, uh, a year in front of us that is going to be truly consequential. Uh, I'm going to echo to a great degree the priorities outlined in this uncertain time. We see three very important areas where the IMF ought to serve the membership uh, with mission. One, pursue a exit from the health crisis and the economic crisis, uh, COVID-19. And what it means is very important role for international cooperation in this race between the vaccines and the virus, we ought to win it everywhere. If we do, as you said, the economic benefits are enormous. We are going to get uh, $9 trillion more in global output between now and 2025. 
if we press on action in the uh, delivery uh, of vaccines everywhere. And while we are still struggling with the health crisis, we do need to continue to provide support through monetary accommodation and fiscal measures so we prevent a massive scarring uh, as a result of bankruptcies and going up. Scarring, however, is not going to be none, even if we are successful over the next uh, months a year. Therefore, we will have shape up supportingly, target the most vulnerable and offer a helping hand to workers that are going to be inevitably affected by accelerated automation and digitalization. What we also have to do, as you stressed, as our second priority is to pursue a recovery that is truly transformative, inclusive, green, smart. And that nation can be steered with good policies. And I saw so it you envisage more equality, more fair in our lives, and accelerated transition to the new climate economy that is bound to secure benefits in terms of new jobs and new opportunities, but also a protection against a looming climate crisis. And rest assured, the IMF will be a very important surveillance to the way we shape our programs and provide capacity development support. Last but not least, we are facing an uneven recovery. And the risk of growing divergence between rich and poor countries, unless we act, that requires from us at the IMF to think how we can generate more resources, how we can help countries burdened by a high level of debt to bring this debt level down. So a lot for us uh, to do, and I have thought that we could not be in better hands than to have you, uh, Magdalena, steering the IMFC over the next three years. And let me say in conclusion also a word of thanks since I have a chance uh, to look at you with the Swedish and EU flags uh, behind. Uh, Sweden is uh, of the uh, uh, early member of the IMF, uh, to be exact, the first member. Uh, and in August uh, uh, this year, we are going to acknowledge 70 years of membership of Sweden at the IMF. Throughout this period of membership, and no doubt in the future, we can always count on Sweden for progressive uh, policies, for emphasis equality, on the ability to create more dynamic, more competitive economies, and to pursue the betterment of everyone, everywhere. Sweden to have the uh, uh, one trillion dollars lending capacity at the fund uh, by participating in the uh, new arrangements to Euro uh, and the bilateral borrowing arrangements. And Sweden has gone beyond that, being a helping hand to capacity development, especially uh, on tax policy and on financial inclusion. And for this, I'm very grateful to the uh, Swedish authorities and to the people of Sweden. Uh, I am uh, uh, to the European Union, as you know, Magda, and I recognize that the European Union 
very much shapes of priorities for its members uh, for green equitable uh, growth uh, that are priorities that we more broadly embrace in the work, work we would be doing uh, in 2021, two and three, the years of your term. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Very best of luck in the uh, chair, in the chair of the IMFC, Magdalena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristalina. Thank you for your kind words. And I really look forward to working together with you and for, I'm sure we will have a really good cooperation. I think now we open the floor for, uh, for questions from journalists around the world. All right, and we'll start off with uh, Bloomberg. Yes, my name is Rafaela Lindeberg. I'm from Bloomberg, and I have two questions for Managing Director Georgieva um, of Fiscal Stimulus. He said recently that governments should spend as much as they can to do whatever it takes to stimulate during this crisis. And uh, Magdalena Anderson is known for a somewhat more frugal approach to fiscal policy. And how do you expect to get along? Much for this question. Uh, the point uh, I made is one that we also heard from uh, Minister Anderson that we cannot afford to withdraw support prematurely until we see the health crisis in the rearview mirror. It is important that governments within their fiscal space, within their capacity, and of course, reflecting on the needs of their economies. Uh, are there to make sure that we can build the bridge over the health crisis uh, into recovery. Uh, as the minister uh, emphasized, this support is not going to be forever. And at, some, at the point when we are through the health crisis, uh, we do need to build fiscal consolidation measures that allow us to have the strength for future shocks to come. What we have seen in this crisis so clearly is that countries like Sweden that stepped into the crisis with strong fundamentals have been more resilient and more able to provide the support that is necessary. And let me uh, stress that the affordability of fiscal measures and accommodative monetary policy is a factor in the speed of the recovery. Advanced economies have been able to provide on average 20% of GDP in terms of support measures, emerging markets 6%, low income countries 2%. And for us at the fund, it is very important to be there for countries that are with very limited fiscal space so we can help them also provide the necessary support while we are striving to exit the health crisis. And of course, as we do that, the, I, want to, I want to get to that point of making sure that as we move forward, we also target the support where it would be most needed. So if you would look, for example, to the EU rescue package that was negotiated before the second wave of COVID, is it sufficient just according to you or do we need more stimulus now as the second wave has turned out to be so much worse than expected with new lockdowns? Uh, it is very important uh, to uh, recognize the high degree of uncertainty within which we operate. Uh, we got a very good third quarter. And uh, on that basis, uh, what we could see is uh, that the uh, pressure for uh, fiscal support is somewhat. And then uh, many countries were hit by a second wave uh, that led to new restrictions and uh, uh, the need to calibrate support and in some cases build it up. Uh, we 
are at a time when vaccines are moving into uh, implementation of massive vaccinations, but they're not done yet. And uh, for that reason, what we strongly advise governments is to calibrate support depending on progress we are making to exit the health crisis. Not too early to withdraw and to calibrate it in terms of size according to how we are progressing with this key determinant, which is the scale and the scope of the health crisis that imposes uh, a scale and scope of restrictions uh, on our economies. But let me, let me say, if I may, uh, we need to give credit where, where credit is due. One, uh, there has been decisiveness in uh, uh, providing the support of monetary and fiscal uh, measures. Uh, and I don't think that we give enough credit to what central banks and minister, ministries of finance have done in the world swiftly to put the floor under the world economy and to continue to protect it against the health crisis. Second, we are doing better in adjusting to function within the parameters of the, the health crisis. The uh, measures we take, masks, social distancing, uh, moving big chunk of me to operate, uh, to operate online, they are improving economic performance, even with the health crisis uh, being uh, with us. And uh, last but not least, uh, there has been maturity in judgment of fiscal authority measures be as possible monetary measures, and that has been uh, a success story and continues to be uh, so. One very important for fiscal measures, uh, objective for fiscal measures, is to also target better the most vulnerable parts of the economy and mo most vulnerable people, something that uh, monetary accommodation cannot do so effectively. And that combination uh, we are seeing across the world more maturity of how these two levers, monetary policy and fiscal policy, are put in place. Okay, and then we have a question from uh, Reuters. Good morning, Kristalina. So nice to see you. Happy New Year. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Madam Finance Minister. I, I wanted to follow up on what you said about the need to continue supporting the, um, or to find new resources. So there's been difficulty in getting agreement on having a, uh, a new allocation of SDR, uh, special drawing rights. Do you think that will change now that there is a change in, in the US government coming? Your largest shareholder has been opposed to doing a large uh, allocation. Um, I'm just trying to interpret your comment about the need for additional resources. Um, I also want to ask you about the um, need to perhaps even look at the sale of gold reserves and also the um, uh, question of whether uh, the uh, freeze or the moratorium and debt service payments should be extended to, and, and also the common framework uh, that was agreed by the G20 should be extended to include more countries. In other words, the middle income countries, small island states. Thanks. Uh, these are also for our incoming chair. Uh, but let me, since you asked me, I would, I would say a word, but I do hope that Magdalena would express views. Uh, these are uh, shareholder uh, questions, in fact. Uh, so first, uh, let me say that um, uh, we have seen a um, increased demand for reasons. Uh, countries, emerging markets with weak fundamentals found themselves in grave difficulty because even with massive liquidity made available by many central banks that allowed many emerging markets to 
at low cost. For this group of countries, this access is either non-existent or prohibitively expensive. So it became very important for the IMF to rapidly expand concessional finance for which we did tap into existing SDRs. And I'm stressing this because it played such an important role in 2020. Uh, some $20 billion of existing SDRs were provided to the IMF to own land to low income countries at high national terms. That is going to be a need in the future. It will continue to be so important, even more important for us to be able to expand our capacity to support countries that are falling behind. Not to have the fiscal space for health measures and to protect the most today, but also to have fiscal space to take this transition to digital and green that the world as a whole is selling. And in that sense, having more liquidity, uh, having more concessional capacity, uh, an SDR, a new SDR allocation can be very helpful. See how this discussion would go. The membership never took this off the table. Uh, and they actually have uh, been uh, bringing it uh, up. Members have been bringing it up. So it will be, it will be discussed and uh, uh, we will have uh, the uh, uh, steer of ministers as we go through this uh, discussion. With regard to um, gold sales, uh, let's remember that gold does serve a purpose it is part of the financial strength of the IMF that makes it possible for us to lend to countries bigger fundamentals. And in that sense, um, a, a gold sale, uh, if the membership decides to go for it, does have some opportunity cost for the financial strength of the IMF. Uh, it was done in the past, and again, it is a membership matter. Minister Person may have some views on that. I'm sorry. It's, uh... so, uh... Okay, done, taken, taken off. Well, that is the new digital world. These things happen. So we would hear from, minister, from, from the minister her view uh, on that. And finally on that, uh, this crisis is not going uh, fast enough for us to say, oh, well, come say April, it is all done. Uh, and we do not need to extend the uh, debt service suspension initiative. Uh, my personal view was, uh, uh, or actually not my well, our professional view at the fund was that uh, uh, a year extension in October uh, was uh, warranted. The membership decided to go for six months extension. Uh, comes April, this question will again uh, revisit it, and it is uh, very likely that the pressure to extend six more months uh, uh, will be still there. Uh, but I think I think it is fair that Minister. Uh, Anderson, since these are uh, membership matters, uh, gives us uh, gives you um, uh, her views. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I mean, the need for liquidity in the world economy is uh, very big and will continue to be big in uh, quite some time ahead. And of course, to have a well-funded and well-resourced IMF is central to support the global economy. And of course, uh, one of the issues I have uh, discussed and uh, before I was elected, but also when I have uh, contacts as a chair with, uh, with my colleagues, uh, this will be one of the issues that will be discussed. And of course, I will investigate the appetite among uh, uh, colleague ministers uh, for what way to proceed forward. Uh, but the need for liquidity is definitely big. Then there is no question about from my perspective, but also when I listen with my uh, and talk to my colleagues. 
when it comes to the uh, debt suspension initiative, uh, I look forward to discussing this and will be discussed during spring. And my forecast is that there will be good and strong arguments for a prolongation. But of course, it depends also what happens when the rollout of the vaccine now in the coming months. Thank you. And now we have a question from the Africa Bazaar magazine. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry, is, is it possible for you to um, turn off your speaker? Yeah, I need to do that. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, given what has been going on for the past uh, more than 10 months uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, I was wondering whether regarding Africa, if you plan to make any changes to the plan that you have in place, whether to update some of the program or just uh, keep any of the program that, that you have. Uh, my other question is regarding Sudan. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin from the U.S. was recently in Sudan, and he said the U.S. The US plans to work with uh, the country and uh, with the World Bank to provide debt relief. And I was wondering if uh, you could talk about that, whether that's, that's something that you plan to be involved in. Would you like to go first? No, no Cristalina, you go first. Uh, other stuff, and then I'll follow. No, you go first, Cristalina. I can follow then. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Africa. Um, very important that we stand by. Africa. As the minister said, we face the risk of losing progress uh, that has been made, impressive progress that has been made in development over the last decades, unless we act uh, decisively. Uh, Africa in uh, 2020 uh, shrunk for the first time uh, since majority of African countries uh, obtained their independence. Um, and it is very important that we are concerned about a growth impetus in Africa. For 2021, very uh, project the world economy to grow over 5% and the African economies to grow uh, 3%. Clearly, this is not enough. Africa needs to grow 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%. It has wonderful opportunities uh, uh, to grow. Uh, but right now, it is very uh, restricted in terms of uh, um, access to financing, and many countries are affected tremendously, not by the big fact of mortality and morbidity in a youthful continent uh, has been somewhat less, although the trend recently in, in, in a number of countries uh, goes in the wrong direction. Stop. But the economic devastation from COVID has been a very uh, significant in uh, countries that are either tourism dependent or commodity exports uh, dependent. Uh, we have seen uh, a number of months of very, very harsh conditions. Uh, for this reason, what we did in 2020 was to very massively lean forward with emergency financing, uh, making sure that um, countries do have the uh, capacity to their economy economy and more importantly their most vulnerable people. In 2021, I don't anticipate for us to continue with emergency financing unless there are shocks that are justified. What we want is to work with countries on helping them have fiscal 
to address the scarcity crisis, and most importantly, to take on the opportunity for economic transformation, accelerating digital and accelerating uh, climate resilience um, uh, and in, in, in some countries, low carbon uh, investments that they can make with public support, but also make sure that this public support is oriented towards addressing issues of governance. So have attractiveness for private sector domestically and uh, uh, also foreign direct investments to flow into Africa. Uh, and again, I want to stress this is a co continent of opportunities uh, and it is important that these opportunities uh, are not foregone because of lack of decisive uh, domestic and international action. Uh, Sudan, we actually just had a, um, a board discussion at the front on Sudan. Uh, we have a staff monitoring uh, program. We are working very intensively with Sudan to build the preconditions for debt relief. So Sudan can uh, become um, eligible for HIPIC. Uh, it is not an easy uh, case. This is the longest in arrears being in a real uh, country. Therefore, it not to be uh, trivial, but uh, I was very encouraged by the strong support from the membership. We are going to have uh, uh, some time in March an assessment of how the staff monitoring program is advancing. And we do hope as swiftly as possible to present to the membership a strong case on uh, Sudan uh, for HIPIC, so the country can reintegrate uh, in the, with the international uh, community. Uh, we are encouraged by the determination of the Sudanese uh, authorities. As you know, this is an, an incredible story. And the women, said enough is enough to the old regime. Uh, and we want to be there for the whole country. Uh, I, uh, I expect that in March, we will have to tell you more about Sudan and the prospects of a real clearance and debt relief uh, for the country. And I want to recognize uh, uh, that a number of countries, US, UK, uh, have indicated that uh, once progress is made, uh, uh, they will indeed uh, also step up uh, grant support for Sudan. Thank you, Kristalina. Just to say something about, uh, about Africa. I mean, as I said um, in my introduction, the development we've seen in Africa when it comes to economic development and poverty reduction in the last decades has been fantastic. So many families have been lifted out of poverty. And the halt that we have seen and the setback we've seen during this crisis is truly worrying. And therefore, I see that uh, support from IMF, World Bank and other international institutions will be very important uh, uh, for the com in the coming years to make sure and to do what we can help to put Africa back on track for in economic development. And this together with internal resource mobilization and, and advice and studies that can be done from the IMF uh, will I hope the important uh, pillars when uh, when Africa can uh, go back to a uh, of a trajectory of, of high economic growth and poverty reduction. And just as Kristalina said, there is so much potential in Africa, not the least the demography in that Africa looks very different to that in other parts of the world, which also is something that uh, can help in enduring um, economic growth in the years to come. Okay, the press conference is... Sorry, can, I, can I just add one thing I want what the Minister Anderson said about domestic mobilization. Uh, you would see in our programs as we go forward that we will be assigning uh, a high priority of countries having tax systems uh, that are effectively uh, operating to lift up domestic uh, resources. Uh, we cannot have situations in which uh, tax to GDP 
uh, is so meager that it is hard for the country to invest in people and in infrastructure for growth. Um, when it is below 15% tax to GDP, that is holding countries. So this message on domestic resource mobilization, uh, the right tax policies and ability to collect taxes uh, uh, for the good of people that this is being recognized. Okay, thank you so much for participating in this press conference. It has now come to an end. Uh, in a few minutes, the Minister of Finance will be available for uh, bilaterals.